Welcome back. This is Microsoft Virtual Academy. We are here for the jump start for C Sharp. This is module four. My name is Jerry Nixon. I'm here with Darren. Welcome back, Darren. Glad to be here. What will we be talking about now? We have the incredibly illuminating title of Features of C Sharp Part 3. <laughs> Great. But the overview is we're going to be looking at code reflection and obtaining type information from that process. Mm. And also working with garbage collection, which sounds incredibly interesting. This is all very disgusting. <laughs> all right, so uh, first is code, code reflection, which is very powerful. We're talking about, we already talked about types and its metadata. We'll be getting into that. Beautiful. All right, let's, let's jump into it and, uh, and go to town here. So, what is reflection, Jerry? Reflection is the, it, well, reflection is a great name, actually. Reflection really does mean to look back. And then, so, reflection allows me to look back at my code or back at an object and interrogate it for whatever it's, it has defined in this metadata. So, I can say, for example, I'm looking at an object. I would ask, you know, what methods does it have? I can use reflection to literally answer that question, to reflect into an object and bring it back to me. Over answered? No, that's perfectly fine. Um, so you, you talk about metadata. And so you know, we've mentioned before when we're talking about types and how a type stores that metadata. So reflection is that kind of window into that metadata and allows us to use it programmatically as well as allowing the compiler to interact and understand what capabilities are on a type. And I can find out all kinds of things from an object, including just its simple name, but also its family. So what, what, you know, where it comes from, what it inherits, what namespace it's in, what assembly it's in. A lot of information. Yeah. And so, you know, why would that be useful? Well, it's useful for a couple ways. Wow, my goodness, there's so many, so many exactly. implications. The mind boggles. Oh, man. Well, for one, it could just be interesting, right? You, you receive an assembly from somebody else. It's poorly documented, and, it's, mm -hmm. and now you need to be able to understand it. You could use reflection for that. Okay. There are tools that already do that for you and bring it to you in a graphical way. But in a programmatic sense, it might be because you want to reach into an object, and you want to be able to get information that may or may not exist. I want to, uh, you give me a whole series of objects. I want to get the name, but first I'll check to make sure they even have a property of name, and I go through that because it's, I don't have an interface to help me with that. So instead, I can use reflection to verify a structure. That's one option. Okay. So you might be interacting with something in a more dynamic way. Mm. You, know, you wouldn't choose to do this over and above the way that uh, we, we've been interacting with them thus far by creating an instance of the type and interacting with them in a strong, strongly typed way by invoking their methods. And I think it, and the reason is, and this is worth remembering, is reflection isn't free. Yes. It can be very costly to do reflection. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. It just means you should do it. Um, with uh, care. Yeah, so basically the compiler, when we, we're interacting with the objects in the more traditional sense, knows exactly where the method is and doesn't have to worry about going and finding it and so on and produces very efficient and optimized code. Whereas if we're using reflection, we have to interrogate the metadata of, of a type and then interact with that in a different way. Consider is that we showed earlier. If you were going to see if an object is a dog, in order to use reflection for that, you yeah. would have to check all of its properties or present, right type, whether or not they're available, its methods, and all this other And business. as you mentioned, we'd have to walk up that tree mm. because we would need to find, OK, what does this type inherit from another type other than object? Yes, OK, go and get that type. Is that on there? No, OK. Does this inherit? And so on and so forth. So we would have to walk the tree. Reflection itself is expensive, but this constant iteration is expensive as well. That's the reason we have these other ways. However, reflection is great, and there are right times to use it. Exactly. You know, some typical scenarios when you would use it are dynamic extensions of your application. If you want to load a module at runtime that may be dropped into a directory, you could dynamically load in that assembly, and then you could use reflection to go and find, okay, are there any implementations of a specific interface mm. in this assembly and so on. It's very, very powerful, but let's kind of get to the nuts Including and bolts. if it has a constructor and all these other pieces so you can interact with it properly. That is an interesting dynamic way to do it. Uh, speaking of dynamic, it might be, um, you know, you could, you could flag your code so you could inject things into it. And that flag is, you could reflect to find all the flags. Okay, yeah. That's harking back to the attributes. That's or right. Attributes, I guess you. But that's right. Okay. Attributes. Indeed. Attri yes. So that's how do we get this type data? using reflection. I mean, there's, there's actually two ways. We can do it at compile time, uh, should we so wish. If, for example, we know that we're going to be interacting with a type of dog, we can use the uh, keyword type of and mention the uh, class that we wish to get the metadata for, and then we've got that type information available. You might argue, if we already have the dog type and we already know about it, why would we do it? It's a good question, well asked. The framework supports that anyway, should you need to. The other way we can do it is at runtime. 
We can... Uh, uh, one of the reasons you might is because of methods on the type that absolutely. you might need to interact with it. Exactly. Um, another way you can do it is at runtime, you can interrogate an existing instance of a type and ask and call its get type method. So that is evaluated type. Uh, runtime will return back an instance of type. Both techniques return a type. One is on the definition itself, one is on an instance. Yeah. So the type class represents the metadata that any type in the uh, managed environment returns. Makes sense to me. Okay. Makes sense to me. It is nice. I mean, if you're interacting with a list of something, you, you can interrogate what type it is and, and change your logic based on it. And it's also, you could use it for security as well to make sure the types that people are passing you are not invalid. Not from a type safe sense, but from a a, you shouldn't be using this type of user in this uh, operation. Yep. Okay. So typically, once you've got a type, uh, if you actually want to start interacting with it at runtime, you want to call its methods and so on and so forth, you need to get a hold of an instance of that type. So there's a couple of different ways that you can actually do that. There's a nice utility class called Activator that's in the system.reflection namespace that has a create instance method with a number of overloads of that method. Uh, the first one uh, that was around since uh, C Sharp 1.0 just returns back a object, mm. which you would need to cast into the type that you're looking for. So this on the right-hand side here, you see var new dog is equal to a, uh, a dog instance. We're casting the result of the create instance method, and we're passing in the type of dog so that the create instance no knows how to uh, go and create an instance of this. That is basically calling a default constructor on dog to return back that instance. Now, there is, of course, a way to call more than a, a default constructor if Absolutely. you want to. And, and, of we'll course, and we have generic dog, which is using a much nicer implementation, right? We, yes. We're using generics, saying the type that will be returned. We don't have to do a bunch of, a bunch of casting. This is our way of communicating directly to it. Look how readable that is in exactly. the second line compared to the first. I know there's been a couple of questions about you know, what is really the value of generics and so on. I hope this really gives you a good example because you know exactly what type the create instance is uh, returning and inside that create instance implementation it's optimized to be able to deal with these types yeah that's right it's very powerful um, now being able to reflect and create an object just knowing its type that's really neat I mean I can really start to use it without having to say equals new dog because I may not know new dog right that I, we say dog but it might be T yep yeah absolutely and so what we actually have here is showing how you can move through the constructors of a given type and actually bring those up. And actually, I noticed a, a typo on this one, that uh, that shouldn't be null at the bottom there, that final parameter. That should actually be passing in an empty array of objects, mm. which should be the parameters passed. So that's a, that's a mistake on here. Ah, oh, that's, that's in case the constructor takes two, three, four different parameters, arguments, different things to come into it. Exactly. Oh my goodness. Then there I can put them in an array, pass them into it. Exactly. I can't do it explicitly because it doesn't know. It's, you're invoking an unknown uh, method, so it allows you to do that with an array. Correct. Yeah, that's nice. So uh, probably, that's handy. I honestly, I've done that a, a, a dozen times in my career. What I've done hundreds of times is reflect into a property. That's exactly, something you've already really... been passed a constructed uh, instance, yeah. and so then you want to interact with that. And so there's a number of nice utility functions that are exposed out that allow us to interact with those. What we're showing right now is a slide that shows how you could interact with properties. Yeah, that's right. And so, um, I, first of all, you, you get the type. that You just can't forget that step, right? You get the type, and the type itself will give you its property. And once you get the property from a type, it's not enough. You have to go back then to the instance if you want to get its value. So here we are. We have a horse, and it's an animal. Its name is Ed. And uh, so I can first I get the type, and that's just animal. It's not the instance of what I have. I'm just pulling back animal again. And I can see there's a property called name. And of course, I can see that I've interacted with it already. And uh, now that I have a reference to that property called property, it's not a reference to the instance of that property. So when I want to get its value, I have to pass in that, that reference of horse. So basically, get property pulls in the metadata that defines a property at the class level, but now we need to turn around and say, and now we mean this property name That's on right. an instance. So when we see that line that says var property, the value of that is actually property info. Ah. It's just the metadata that's exposed for that property from its type. It has nothing to do with the property itself. 
Interesting. Yeah, it's really neat. It really is neat. And so anyway, that's a great way to get it. Of course, there's a, a corollary to set value as well. So you can interact with properties without having to know the type directly or whether or not it has a property. Of course, I can say if property is null, and then I can from there I can say if property is null, don't do it. Right? Yep. And so I can do a test as well, not interact with an object that may not have that property. That's awesome. Hmm. So how about methods? Can we do some, something similar with methods? No, we can't. No, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, let's go to the next that's slide. That's Yeah, <laughs> Of course you can, right? <laughs> Reflection is how it all works under the scenes. And this Indeed. is a, a namespace that exposes it to the developer so they can do it too. And so method, of course, is a natural one. It works, honestly, very similar to invoking a class and calling its constructor. And so just like uh, before, we have our, our uh, horse. And in this type, so we get the type. And method now is not the method. Just like before when it was only property info, now we have only method info. And it's all of the metadata exposed by the type about that property. It's specifically, it's signature, return types, whether or not it's public to be able to call in the first place. Just like before, there's a method that allows us to uh, call it. We're not getting the value of a method. We're invoking it. So you can say dot invoke. Then we pass in the instance we want to invoke that on. In this case, horse. And, so it, and so it runs it. Great. So the uh, demo project is 004, if you want to explore that. I do indeed. Let me pull that up. Here's one we prepared earlier. Yeah, it's nice. All right, so here we are. Good. Dogs. All right. So this is the uh, this is very similar to the same pro uh, same process we were just uh, demonstrating. So let me go down to the actual definition first, so we can see that we have a class. It's a dog with a uh, property of number of legs, and so uh, in its constructor we set the number of legs to four. Right, so this is the default constructor. This is the one that's called automatically if you don't do, if you don't specify anything. And so by default it has four. Or you can manually call a different constructor. This is an overload of, a, of its constructor to set whatever legs you want. Of course, you you could set it in the property as well, but this is just to make the point. All right. So here we are. I'll go ahead and create dog. And what's interesting about it, I could use var like before. And var is a reminder. Var is just a shortcut, so I don't have to say this is a dog, right? But uh, object is fun because I can bring it all the way down to the base of every type of class. So I can say object dog. And now dog really is a dog, but I set it as an object. Mm -hmm. It's nice, right? So yeah. now I can do anything to it. Um, and uh, I don't have to, though. I could, I could do reflection well, against a strong what the, um, type. What methods are exposed on dog at that point? So now dog dot. Nothing at all. These four methods that are in, in uh, the ultimate base of objects, mm -hmm. and really nothing else. We know that dog has a number of legs, yep. and so we can't get to it. If I were to switch this to, uh, to dog, right, then it would be strongly typed to dog, and it would know I could interact with it like that. Or I could use var, and var will cast it back to object. an object. That's exactly right. That's because create instance doesn't know what it's returning. It just returns back an object. I need to cast it yet again. And so uh, I, could, I could do that here as dog. And now because I've done that, of course, the compiler is very smart and knows the var says, and var simply says, whatever's after the equals is what this is. There it is. All right, so now we've got dog. Dog dot number of legs is right there. OK, so here we are. Uh, the first thing I want to do is find all of the properties inside dog. So the first thing I'll do is get its type. And I can say type of dog. Another thing I could say is dog.getType. The difference is whether, whether or not you're interacting with a, uh, the instance of the object or just the reference to its type. All right, so here we are. I have its type. And type has this property, get properties, returns an array of all of the properties. We only have one property, so it's going to be an array with a member of one. And then I can get the property info. Remember, that's what we actually get from reflection. To get its property, and here I know that there's only one, so I can go to this ordinal position. So many ways I could get it, right? Exactly. I, I don't have to say get properties. I could also say get property, and it just gets a single one, and I can specify its individual name of legs or, or whatever it is. Yeah. So basically, what we're showing here is just how rich the reflection API is. And, uh, you know, some of the challenges sometimes when you're working with these uh, very rich frameworks is there are so many different ways hmm. to solve a problem that often it's it's challenging to know exactly which path to take. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The, I would recommend our path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's just us. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, I mean, this is where we're about now to uh, get, we could get its value. But rather than get its value, so many other things you can do with it, it's, it's checking it, and, you know, making sure it's there so you don't continue with an operation if something is missing. It's re really nice. All right, so this, what are we looking at here? 
That's just basically allowing us to iterate through. So instead of saying get property name, mm -hmm. we could turn around and say we, we might be looking for a property that uh, deals with the specific type. So if we were, say, assigning a handler, and we had a property that said what the handler was. We could iterate through the properties and look what the value is, and then we don't even need to worry about do we know the name of the property? Mm. Because in many of these cases, you know, if we're reflecting over something, we probably don't know what the property names are ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, we're interacting with it. <laughs> this is this is cool because we we're really introducing uh, some interesting things here. So um, yeah, so we're gonna we're looping through. Of course, we talked about for each in the last uh, module. We're looping through all the properties, which are just property infos, not properties. And so we'll loop, loop through each one, and then we do a quick interrogation. And it's interesting because property info will tell us the name, right? Because that doesn't have anything to do with the instance. Yep. And then we call equals. Isn't that an interesting method on a string? Of course, we know name is a string. Equals, yeah. is, is uh, it's fun. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more about handling equality, mm -hmm. but equals is looking for the value, not its actual. Yes, because one of the key things uh, when, you got, when you're comparing reference types is it's checking to see, is the reference the same mm. by default? And so if you mean something different, you have to be very explicit that you mean something different. And uh, in the .NET framework, you, know, you have the ability to specify comparators and inject comparators into an equality statement. You can also turn around and say, OK, how should this comparison be done? So in here, for example, we've specified that the comparison should be invariant, i.e. not specific to a particular cul uh, culture. You can specify to use the current culture. You can also specify things like don't look at case. Don't worry about case. That's exactly right. But that's important too because often if you don't do that, you're going to have to call too lower to, I mean, all these things you have to do and you don't have to if you use everything properly. Indeed. This isn't even necessary. I mean, you could take it away and it'll default for you, but it gives you all this other power if you do include it. Yeah, no doubt great about point. it. This is great. And so this is just, uh, now I'm looking to see if number of legs is there and if so, interact with it. Okay. Yep. And so here we are, setting. So here's your setting value. Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so here I set the value. It's dog is the instance. Of course, remember right at the top, we, in, we created it with reflection, just to be fancy. And uh, so we, uh, now we're setting dog to a value of three. And the, uh, there we are. That's uh, tricky. And the, the third, and it's almost always null, because it's a very special case and exactly. when you want it, is uh, whether or not there's any, what? Indexes. Yeah, and there's, there rarely are. All right. So it depends on the type. It only depends on the type. Yeah. And then we uh, write it out just so we can prove that we got it. Here's so this how we... poor dog only has three legs? Yeah, it's, it, it's that dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's Lassie with one S. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> Good. And now we start interrogating the type itself. So now we have our dog, and we want to get the constructor on the dog. This is because we're going to call it, and we need to understand it. Like, what do we need to pass to it? And so basically what we're going through here is illustrating how we can iterate through and find different types of constructor. So the first one gets the constructor that takes no parameters. And if Which we look down one? here, we have that constructor. Then we have a second constructor that actually takes an integer value. And so this is how we pass in an array that contains the int type. And what con get constructor does here is looks for a constructor that matches that pattern. Right. What we're not asking for is all the constructors you have. We're asking for a specific constructor. And to be specific, we say what the signature is. Now you might say, OK, well, how can we um, always guarantee that we're only going to get back one? Well, when we created the type, the compiler will have enforced the fact that we can only have one constructor for any given signature. Goes back to method signatures. Signatures are unique. Strong typing. Right, so we know we won't kill that. All right, so here we are again. Now we're calling for, we're, now, we're, now we're invoking the constructor, which will return a type. Yep, and it's going to invoke the default constructor. So if we look at dog, we'll see the uh, default definition of dog will set its number of legs equal to four. So on that console write line, we'd have output four. It's sure better. It <laughs> certainly better had. Yep. On the second one, we've actually got a very strange dog. It actually has five legs. And so we're invoking the constructor with five, and that will be the output there. In fact, let me. Uh let me run this, and uh, you know, I'll let me step into it right here. Um, let me—I may not have set this. Let me go ahead and set it as the uh, startup project, and we'll take a look. Okay, so we've already gotten it, and so if you look at the output here, we have three, which is because it's reading from what we set. Right, this is the line that reads the number of legs that we set because we are doing it through reflection, and then here comes the default constructor. 
and oops, F5 over here. And we create the first one, which the default constructor sets it automatically to four. Then we use the custom constructor, which sets it to five. Powerful. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, yeah. Interact with the methods, interact with properties, create the objects if we want to. A lot of power. Now, if we've really just touched the surface of what you can do with the reflection in terms of interacting with assemblies, loading them in, moving through those assemblies, and so on. You also can interact with generics uh, using the reflection. And that starts to get to a little bit more complex syntax mm. and so on. But if you find that you need to do that, there's, there's a lot of do good documentation on MSDN and elsewhere in terms of how to actually interact with those. It's worth knowing you can. Sometimes exactly. that's the most important part is just to know you can so you don't chase a rabbit. To a certain extent, that's really what we're trying to achieve with this particular course is really to open everybody's eyes to some of the richness around there, to give you those elements that you can focus on for passing the certification and so on. We're condensing those five days into uh, one day, so necessarily we can't dwell on all of these subjects to the depth that yeah. perhaps they deserve. Darren, do you remember um, a few modules ago, we were talking about handling an event. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you handle an event, it was like a string uh, between that event and your listener and your yes. handler. And uh, so then there was this issue of you have this string, and then we're, here we are in reflection. We're creating objects. Now, there's, there, are all, there are a lot of consequences to memory. And, I, and we know, of course, that in a managed environment, that's handled with garbage collection. So let's, let's transition over to garbage collection. Very fun to talk about garbage collection. It's not as gross as it sounds. <laughs> Indeed not, because no. you don't have to get your hands dirty on it. Not at all. That's right. Bum, bum. There, there's a garbage man. Exactly. And or that woman. is the runtime for you. Yes. It's a I garbage mean, thing. The run, yeah, the runtime doesn't have a gender. Indeed. Yeah. It is a thing. Let's call it a thing. It's a garbage. So what is garbage collection? Well, as Jerry just uh, alluded to, it's effectively it's the implementation of automatic memory management within the .NET framework and the CLR. And what it does for us is it worries about uh, objects we're no longer using and cleans them up for us. Hmm. Um, the key thing to understand, though, is that it doesn't necessarily do it straight away. Hmm. So. And there are many good reasons for that. Uh, one of them is performance. That it can be computationally expensive for the uh, garbage collector to iterate through all its object store and to follow any reference chains to ensure that the object is no longer referenced. Hmm. In order to do that in an efficient way, it breaks things up into a number of different generations. Um, so those short-lived objects get reclaimed first. Those that have been around for a long time tend to be held on to for a little bit longer before they get disposed. A, a garbage generation is complicated. Um, so let, let me try with an analogy. Go for so it. So imagine the Serengeti, right? We've got wildebeest running around. And uh, you know, it's the natural course of nature for families of wildebeest to run around the Serengeti. But we also have lions, and the lions are prowling around, looking for that the baby wildebeest that strays away from its family, and it's out there by itself just causing trouble, and the lion eats the wildebeest. That's garbage. The lion is garbage collection. I see. Because what you have is you have your code, and everything's in the family. Everything's referenced. Everything is working the way it's supposed to. And every once in a while, you have these orphan events that go off by themselves, right? Or I'm sorry, orphan objects, right? They no longer have any reference. You're never going to use them again. They're off, and really, all they're doing is taking up space and eating from the Serengeti when you don't need so to. So basically, it's harvesting the the easy ones first before it starts looking at the more the harder targets. That's the truth, actually. That is the way, I mean, there's a, there is a heuristic around garbage mm -hmm. collection, and the lion really is the example of it's cleaning up all around, but it's leaving the herd, right? It's leaving your application so exactly. that everything is referenced and done properly, just moves on. But if you have to spend time now chasing out all of these things that you don't reference anymore mm -hmm. so that you don't take up all the memory space with them, that's a mess for you. It's a pain. C++ developers do it today. .NET developers don't because they have garbage collection that takes care of the whole thing. So a good example of an easy victim yeah. uh, for garbage collection would be a local variable that's defined within the scope of a method when mm -hmm. the method closes. That's right. There's your baby antelope. It's over. Yeah. Now it's antelopes. Yeah. Exactly. It sounds delicious. Indeed. Yum. <laughs> um, now <laughs> it is important to say that for the sake of the for the sake of the the, the computer that's running, garbage collection isn't free. It's right. Not it's free. doing work for you, and it is real. But the work. line gets tired when it runs. It does indeed. Yes, sometimes those orphans are fast. <laughs> now we're eating puppies yeah, for we're breakfast. we're stretching the analogy. Killing orphans. Yeah. Right, okay. Okay. Let's move on. It's terrible. <laughs> okay. 
So, um, as you say, it's expensive. Um, the system has an algorithm which determines when to run, and it normally does so when it detects pressure. And it's it's it hand it's it's not us that's doing it. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we don't influence it, but we can. No, no, we don't control it, but we do influence it. But there are scenarios where we can. Yeah. And when we can turn around and say. I want garbage collection to run. And so now. if we look at this particular slide, you see on the right hand side we've got GC Collect. GC represents the uh, global garbage collector. We have wait for pending finalizers, which will come to what they are in a moment, and then collect again. When this is executing, everything stops. Your application waits until the collect completes, then uh, waits for any pending finalizers. So these are processes that mm -hmm. may be running on objects that are currently prepping for being collected, and then it collects again to clean up those ones that have just finished their finalizers. That's expensive, and you'll only want to do that in specific scenarios. Mm. Typically, when you detect that you have a situation where you have reserved a large amount of system resources, and you wish to clear them up before you get out. So a particular scenario that makes sense is uh, a Windows service. So those of you who may not be familiar with Windows services, they are um, pieces of code that you can register with the system that get run on a periodic basis. It may run once every 24 hours, once a week, or whatever. If you imagine one of these services that is responsible for, say, running through every file and working out whether it's open, it could, in theory, have a lot of resources. Uh, if, say, it's cr creating a, a list of all the file names, that takes up a lot of footprint in memory. Once it's finished with that list, it wants to get rid of it. It doesn't want uh, to leave them sitting out there impacting other applications' performance. And so you could turn around and say, I want my Windows service to release all of those file names, all of the resources related to those, and um, to do it now. Then once I finish this, I go to sleep for 24 hours before I run again. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a very good way of being a nice citizen. It's it's back to the analogy for a second. Uh, you know, you're about to create an orphan, mm -hmm. and you know that it's a it's a it's an expensive, a hungry orphan, right? It yeah. goes out and is eating everything. You you call in the lion. Exactly. Like, there it is. And so it's a, it's it, imagine a loop where um, I'm going through, and every every iteration of that loop. I'm doing something very, very expensive, and at the end of it um, is something, I do release it, but I know that it's still referenced in memory, and mm -hmm. here I go, I'm, that loop's gonna start again. I could call GC Collect and say, now it's time to, to clean house, and yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to do that in every loop, but I have to be careful all of a sudden. And a loop that calls GC Collect. That's a bad thing. Yeah. But I think your, um, your intent is great. You know, you know you've got resources that you wanna let go of, how do you do it? If GC Collect is bad, what's, what's a better way to do it? <laughs> and fortunately, it just so happens, yeah. that we have a capability to do that. It's uh, implementing an interface called iDisposable that effectively marks up an object as complying with what's called the dispose pattern that allows us to preemptively release resources prior to any garbage collection. And so that allows us to be a good citizen, give things back, and then let garbage collector do its own thing in its own time. Yeah. So I dispose. That's common. We see I disposable all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I'll throw a caveat. I disposable is not in Windows 8 app development, right? It's a different mindset. But in all of other development, we get to see I disposable because of the way it communicates to um, to garbage collectors. So it's an interface, which means I have to do it. There's actually an interesting snippet around. Uh, you mentioned uh, Windows App Store development. One of the things that has been done is the close statement has actually been coerced into a dispose to allow you to use uh, using ah, yeah, for yeah. closing, which is actually pretty interesting. We'll get to that shortly. Yeah. So this is a definition. Uh, this, this particular slide shows disposable objects, and for sort of a ease of reading, I've in, in, uh, added in a definition of iDisposable, just so we can see that all it does is state that anything so marked has to have an implementation of the dispose method. And that's it. And that's it. It doesn't say what it does in the dispose method. It doesn't nope. say how big the object is, small, the nothing else. And from that point forward, all we have is dot dispose. Yeah. And so we have a demo class here that implements iDisposable. You can see the syntax there. And it's got an implementation of dispose. And so if, if for example, we imagine that demo uh, had a member variable of an array, and we instantiated the array with uh, t 10 million uh, integers. Yeah, so now that, it's getting full. That it's space is reserved. Hmm. That space is allocated to this demo object. In the dispose method, we could deallocate that by setting the um, array yeah. to zero. 
set it to null, get rid of it, release up all those memory. So that places that memory available for reuse again, even though the demo object itself hasn't been reclaimed yet by the uh, uh, garbage collector. So this is our implementation of doing some mild garbage collection yeah. almost. I like to call it housekeeping. Doing some housekeeping. Exactly. iDisposable is not appropriate for every class. No, it, sometimes it doesn't make sense. If you're not actually hanging on to a significant amount of resources, then don't worry about it. If all your uh, variables are in fact defined on a local scope, yeah. again, don't worry about it. Um, if those things that you're exposing out should last the entire lifetime of that object, again, don't worry about it. If your class represents a stream, if your class represents an uh, outside resource, something that's very expensive, even mildly expensive, mm -hmm. now iDisposable works. Exactly. But if all you have is, a, is an animal class that has yeah. you know, name and number of legs, uh, iDisposable is not appropriate. You could do it still, but you what could, are you going to do? Very little. Yeah, you go through and set all your properties to null. Yeah. Not that useful. There was a time in Visual Basic when that was a big deal. Exactly. and that's. You know, again, it's because you're generally interacting with external elements. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, there's a simple dis uh, disposal pattern. We know there's an advanced disposal pattern. Yeah. Uh, now, give me the short number, the shorthand of that one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we know there's an advanced, but we also have using. <laughs> exactly. So the advanced ver version, just briefly, um, what this allows us to do is to deal with a couple of different scenarios where we're not only dealing with managed resources, i.e. those types that are defined within the uh, managed runtime, but also with external resources such as com and whatever. Hmm. That this allows us to expressly go out and release those external types as part of our dispose cycle. We also introduce in here, if you look down the bottom, we have this little wiggly, then advanced demo. So that's the tilde symbol. That is what's called a finalizer. So that is the inverse of a constructor. And it allows us to perform operations at the end of the life cycle of a managed type. It's not very common that we actually need to do this. Um, typically, the only scenario in which you would do so is releasing resources. And this implements the advanced pattern. Now, what we have is you can see we implement iDisposable. So we have a method that uh, returns void, and it's called dispose. And inside that, we call a, another implementation of dispose with a true parameter, which maps to a disposing uh, parameter. In here, if we're disposing, we can then release managed resources. So what you would have inside there is other managed types that implement the dispose pattern. And we would call dispose on those. So it would cascade a dispose down what's called our object graph, our relation related objects. Outside of that, we would also then set to null any references to external, say, com objects or whatever. So we release our reference on those as well. Once we do that, we are then remove the need to run the finalizer, which is going to call dispose. And so what we have then is after the, uh, the dispose method, we actually turn around and say GC, garbage collector, suppress the execution of finalize, suppress finalize, and we pass in this object instance, which says, don't run it. And effectively, that stops us having to worry about the finalizer trying to rerun and redo dispose. If we haven't called dispose, when garbage collection actually runs, it will call our finalizer, advanced demo, which will then call dispose false. The interesting thing about this scenario is garbage collection will only run if we don't hold references out to other objects that are alive, so we don't need to dispose our managed resources in this scenario, hence we pass in false. Yeah. But we still let go of the managed objects. That's about as quick as I can go through that one. It's tricky business. It is. It is. Uh, it, this is actually, if you are going to implement iDisposable, odds are this is this is the way you're going to have to do it. You're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just a. It's also a friendly way so that you can call dispose without relying on garbage disposal to do it, or garbage collection to do it. All right. So if I let's let's let me show you a, a fun demo here. Yep. Go for it. So let's pretend uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a file real quickly. And what's nice about it is when I read a file, it doesn't it comes back as a stream. And we'll talk about streams. So we want to see your desktop. Stop, yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. So I let me uh, let me set a, a fake path here. Something like test.txt. This is how I would set up whatever the path is. Let's say it's a, a, a real file. This one isn't one. And I want to say um, you know var file equals file dot open file dot open, and then I'm passing whatever its path is, and then a quick little note that I want to open it. Now file. Let me show you the type of file. File returns a 
Stream. And so Stream is actually a, re it's a great example of, a, of something that is a resource that you mm -hmm. want to release. And so now that I have it, it's, it's actually locking the file. Oh, that's, that's painful. Well, it's okay for me because I'm writing to it, but everybody else you might want to use it. Oh, so you don't like to share? Yeah, I don't like to share. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. So the reality is, while that's open, it's important that it be locked because I'm interacting with it and I can't have it um, be indeterminate, right? Mm -hmm. I have to know what's going on. And so it that's locks on purpose. That's a good word purpose. too, that's like polymorphism. Yeah, I know, it's, it, it never stops, man. Indeed. All right, now, in to do here, I have some sort of interaction with the file. Okay. And uh, let's say I'm writing, reading, parsing, whatever it is I do to it, and, uh, and then I'm done. Okay. And that's the end. And so I can't forget to release the stream, right? I can't forget to dispose of it. I actually think it. you can forget. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, you can. <laughs> I shouldn't, I guess is okay. what I meant to say. And so to do that, I'll say file dot close. But what if you leave it open and try to open? open well, let's it say you do forget, which is what yeah. I really actually do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, if you do that, it lo the file remains locked. Okay. And uh, there are processes that will eventually unlock that, but there's a long period that suddenly this file is no longer. So if you accessible. try to open it again, you get an exception. Yeah. So we're, we're going to be doubling uh, what we're going to do in a minute. But yeah. So if I were to run this again, access the exact same one into a different variable like file two, mm -hmm. that would fail because it's already locked and I can't access it the mm -hmm. way I want to. Uh, however, if I call close, I could, I could do it again here mm -hmm. and life would be happy okay. because now it's unlocked because I've closed it. Now because it is easy to forget, there is a nice keyword that we have. Mm. And uh, that's the using keyword it allows us to create a block. Of course a block is just a... Uh, Hang on a second though, don't, don't we have using at the top of the uh, yes, program as Yes we well? do. Mm, yes, kind of like type. So using at the top, just to be clear, which brings in namespaces so that we don't have to reference them completely, is really a different word altogether. And you can know the difference only because they're in different contexts. Ah, okay. You certainly can't reference a, you can't do using namespace inside a method. Uh, you can inside a namespace, interestingly enough. Yep. But uh, the using that I'm talking about is the one that defines the beginning and end of a block, and it looks like this. Okay. So that's a key one. Uh, a lot of people get confused sometimes when they see that in here. And uh, they, they think it's making some sort of reference out to something yeah. and can't, can't quite work out what's going on. No, you're right. It's a, it's a, especially when you're just talking it, when you're just speaking it. Exactly. You know, you don't have the opportunity to see the context. Yeah. And so it's the same, uh, it's just, everything else is the same except for we're wrapping everything in a using. And so if I were to, um, I would take the same line that would that would reopen the file so I could read or manipulate it, and I would just jam it into uh, the using description or the, the uh, using definition, and then in its implementation, I could still have to do that would interact with file exactly mm -hmm. like I had before. That's no change in the code. The one good thing you don't have to do is file that close because as soon as it runs out of scope, which is means it just exits that block, then it will automatically um, dispose of the object for you. It's very very nice, especially with stream. It's, um, it's, 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 it's not unheard of, but it's almost unheard of to see people interact with strings without using a using, partly because it ensures it's always so called using correctly. using dispose? Using will call dispose for you. Yes, the right. Okay. That's exactly right. So that's interesting, but you had file up close. Oh boy, oh. Now, here we go. Well, we gotta, we'll talk about the difference between close and dispose in just a second. But before we do, I, I mean, so that we can make sure we cover it uh, generally. Um, the, it, it is almost uncommon, to, it is almost unheard of to see uh, the interaction with a stream, not only because it, is, uh, it makes sure that it's disposed of properly whenever it falls out of scope, but also because, um, um, but also because it, it allows you to visually see that you're using a type that it is a resource or does have a cost and does need to be disposed without you having to interrogate it um, to the next developer. I always think about that. You know, the, the next developer is going to have to figure this out. This is a good way to communicate to them not only to be safe, but um, also what you're working with and why. Yeah, it's very expressive. It's very expressive. I will say there are times when you don't want to use using. There are times when you need to keep that resource open, and you need even from one method to a method even when you're changing scope. Exactly, and sometimes you can fall into a trap there if you just get into the habit of doing using and then you try and return these things. Yeah. You know, it, the framework is actually very clever around how it manages 
those things if you actually try and return a value from inside there. But bear, bear in mind, you can f get some gotchas there. It does. So let's go back to dispose and close, what sure. we were talking about. So uh, if I dispose of an object, I really am destroying it, right? This is, this is a trash can operation. Exactly. I dispose of it, I throw it away. If an object is disposed, it is effectively unusable. Right. Even though you may still have an instance of it available. Uh, by contrast, let's say a file, which is a, a good example, a file that I close, I'm not destroying anything. I'm, One hopes uh, not. I am closing that lock. And uh, I could, right after close, I could say open again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that allows me to have kind of this toggle on and off depending on cases. And so one big difference between dispose and close, well, probably the big difference, is that dispose isn't reopened, right? It's communicating to the developer this is the end. A close communicates that there is, a, there is an opposing open. And you can call that open again if you want to, right? But there is also another case, right? We could dispose, we could close, or we could stop. stop. And stop is different. Uh, you don't see it quite as much. Mm -hmm. um, you made the point earlier that close is um, can also use a using, uh, especially in Windows 8 development. Um, but stop is different. How is stop different? Well, stop again is it's contextual. I think you have close, which uh, you tend to talk about things that you've opened. Stop tends to uh, be associated with things that you start. So you might have a timer as an example. You start a timer and you stop a timer. You might restart that timer. So again, these are almost verb actions that you're placing against these methods or these um, objects to interact with them. One of the key things is by convention, if you have something that you stop or you close and you're implementing a dispose, you want to ensure during that dispose implementation that you close or stop mm, yeah. what you're calling. And so that's why uh, what Jerry was doing before worked in that he could uh, dispose the interaction with the file stream and the file stream went, oh, I'm being disposed, therefore it would make sense if I close any streams that I have open. Right. Which is pretty slick. Yeah, and so if, if I dispose, it's destroyed. If I close, then I could reopen and mm -hmm. it maintains at least a pointer sort of reference to it. But if I stop, it remains, it, it maintains its state so mm -hmm. that I could could start and it, and it comes back to where it was actually stopped. Exactly. Yeah, it's really nice. Sounds okay. Good. A lot of things here in uh, in um, garbage collection and working with streams. Um, the uh, if if I, and there are a couple penalties to not handling things like this correctly. One of them, of course, we talked about locking the file. Um, another one is it sort of locks the memory. Uh, it sort of makes it so that um, we have what we would call a memory leak. And so we, have, we maintain all of these, um, these resources when we don't need to, and our application suddenly has a nice footprint, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger. So you mentioned memory leaks, and we've just been talking about how great um, garbage collection is in mm -hmm. uh, the managed environment. You know, it manages all the memory for Why us. doesn't it solve this problem? <laughs> Why? Yeah. You know, th that seems crazy. And so there are a couple of little gotchas that you can fall into when you're uh, building these things. What you have to understand is that garbage collection looks at an object and sees, is this object referred to by any other object? Mm. And if, that, if it is referred, then it will not collect it. And so there are ways that you can actually create relationships between objects whereby you've created that reference and you haven't explicitly released it, but then you've removed your ability to interact with that object so you can't ever get back to it. And so it kind of sits there out there as it should be orphaned, but you're hanging on to a reference to it, and so it never gets garbage collected. And if you're doing that in a, an area of the application that gets called repeatedly, then you keep allocating memory, allocating memory, al allocating memory without releasing it until you close down the application. That's the, really the definition of a memory leak. Well, now, we, let's go back to the event, because this, one, this is the one that I think really gets people as well. Um, when I make a, when I listen for an event, I am making a reference now to that object, and the one that's raising the event. And so, so it's actually uh, strongly coupled rather than loosely coupled. That's right. There is a that string between them is tight, and okay. it doesn't break. And um, even though it falls out of scope inside your application, you know what what, what might happen is I'm interacting with that dog that's going to bark, mm -hmm. has spoken, is being listened to by a trainer, and that dog is now gone out of scope. I I feel as if I've deallocated it, but the reality is, as long as there's a trainer listening. It's always there. And even though I can no longer interact with it, garbage collection will not collect it. And so if that dog happens to be an expensive resource taking up a lot of memory, and I create dogs over and over that we listen to, and I'm always having that event handler uh, being listened to by a trainer, 
all those dogs really are still taking up all this memory in my in in app, in, my, in my app domain, but I am not able to collect it until I break that reference. But I'm not breaking the reference because all I am is trying to deallocate it hmm. from the dog's perspective. How do I break that string? That's the that's the thing, and I think this happens a lot, even in Windows development and, and standard development, where I'm listening for let's say a, pay, a window that's that's open in WinForms or WPF development to have some event that fires, yep. and then they close that event. But then they may open up or close that window, and then they may open up another one. And okay. I listen for that one. And they close it. And they, little do I know that all those windows are still there, even yeah. though I can't interact with them anymore. That's crazy. It's 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 brutal. It's very dangerous because it turns out that's that's a bad case of memory leakage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, that sounds scary. Um, it sounds like you're alluding to a couple of uh, coding practices that can be used to uh, offset that. And so one of those is, you know, typically if you're binding to events during a loading activity, yeah. you may want to release that subscription to the event during an unload activity. Yeah, earlier we were talking that you can, uh, you can handle an event with that plus equals. Yep. You can unhandle it then with the minus equals, oh. and it removes that delegate from the delegate list of the event. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, sounds like a good practice. But it sounds like there's probably some other scenarios that we can do around uh, those references. That um, maybe we've got something that is listening, <laughs> but we really don't care to keep it around if it should be That's disposed right. of. And, uh, and, and back to this, this interesting analogy of a string is it's a much thinner string, yeah. right? There still is this connection between these objects. We call these weak references. So oh, we have a okay. standard reference or a strong reference that really does keep the reference um, from being collected. But we can also establish a weak reference to, so, to another object. And then garbage collection will see that and say, those don't matter, right? Only okay. strong references matter. So if there are only weak references on an ob object, the garbage collector will uh, dispose of it. That's exactly right. That's perfect. That's exactly right. So back to our wildebeest. If the wildebeest runs away and you know, and all the, and the, the herd is watching it, that might be a strong reference. Everybody forgets it. That's the, that's the weak reference. Okay. Along so it, comes the line. So if I have a weak reference to something, I can just check its value to see if it's null. If it's null, then the uh, reference has been deleted, basically, because the garbage has been collected. No. No. Oh, because garbage has been collected. Exactly. Yes. Yes, That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we agree. Yes, now we're back on board. There no problem. Um, but there may be a situation where uh, we're doing an atomic operation, hmm. where uh, we've checked, do we have a value in this weak reference? Yes, we do. OK, then I'm going to do this, this, and this on that object. So I've implemented the pattern where it's a weak reference, but for this moment, yeah. make it a strong reference. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how do we stop it from um, being collected part way through? Well, the quick way is to create another reference. OK, so we, well, we create a local variable mm -hmm. that then points to the value of that weak reference. Right, right, right. OK. And then that reference is the one that keeps it alive. Yeah. Yeah. So we haven't really changed the weak reference to be strong. We've added another reference that holds it alive and keeps garbage collection away. Perfect. Mm, nice. OK. All about it. Absolutely. Uh, should we, um, we should take advantage of the time. We should. <laughs> no doubt about it. All right, let's look back. All right, so the, uh, we had a big topic at the beginning, talking about reflection, the ability to take advantage of the metadata that's, that is exposed from types so that we can look into objects that are handed to us to understand what they're like, what properties they may have, the ability to set and be able to read those values. That's really nice, as well as execute methods or invoke methods. And to instantiate an object by only knowing its type and interrogating to see what the constructor is and whether or not it has a specific signature and obeying that signature. Very powerful. That Very powerful. Reflection is there. I think we talked about that reflection is both powerful and dangerous, right? Because mm -hmm. there is a cost to it, and there are many, many other pieces to the framework that allow you to do most of what you're wanting to do. But there are times when reflection is the right solution, the best solution, all, all the way around, and you just yep. absorb that cost. And often the only way. Often, it's the only way. That's mm -hmm. right. Awesome. Um, and then we talked about garbage collection. And this is really more about memory management and the way that uh, the framework will look at what isn't referenced, what's been deallocated, and it will suck that right out of memory. And then the mistakes that we can make by accidentally keeping things in memory, even though we want them to be out, by creating strong references to those and the option to create weak references so that those can be removed. Perfect. Yeah. This is a good session, I this think. This is a good session. Cover a lot of the ground. OK. Now it's lunchtime. This is the end of module four. Now we're going to uh, take a. Starting at one.
Sorry, at the top of the hour. We Sorry. are going to take a break until the top of the hour. So I will see you all in 50 minutes. Bon appetit.